much, Richard, for giving me such a wonderful introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here in this wonderful room uh, to start a new course, um, which is about Sergei Diaghilev. And he'll be very pleased that this course is happening in such a beautiful place, because everything had to be beautiful. Uh, I guess I should mention two things why there's, I approach it with some trepidation. Um, and one is because um, talking about Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe, you have to talk about all the arts at once. You can't even miss out one. You have to talk about the visual arts, you have to talk about choreography, you have to talk about music. And I'm a musicologist, yeah, so I will be d making various amateurish comments, I'm sure. Uh, on the other arts, but I'm very excited by all of that and by, by the whole synthesis of the ballet Russe. So I hope that will carry me through somehow. Uh, and the other um, thing is that there is so much that is known about the ballet Russe. There are so many documents, there are so many paintings, there are so many set designs. Uh, there, there have been so many exhibitions. It's, it's a, a subject that excites everyone. So. Um, it's just impossible to cover everything, yeah, so I'll have to find my own path through it. And uh, music, of course, will guide me, although I will try to uh, also be kind to the other aspects uh, of his creative work. So, Sergei Pavlovich Diaghilev. One thing is uh, in, in my favor is that I'm Russian, so I can pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Sergei Pavlovich Diaghilev, here are his dates, and here are the two quotes which I particularly like. One is, the dream, the purpose of my life is to work creatively in the realm of the arts. Which is not such an easy thing when you don't have a talent for any particular art. Yeah. So, you can paint a little bit, but not well enough. You can play the piano, but not well enough to be a performer. You can compose a little bit, but Rimsky-Korsakov tells you you're no good. Uh, you certainly can't dance. So, yet he was so determined to make a career in the arts, and he made it. Uh, he made it as a manager, as an entrepreneur, as a visionary. Uh, and I guess we just want to have more people like him uh, to promote the arts in the modern world. The other quote is slightly more controversial. It is only success, my friend, that redeems everything and covers up everything. <laughs> yeah, so uh, pursuing artistic ideals, he also always pursued success. Uh, and that was the ultimate goal. But not actually uh, commercial gain. Uh, if uh, on all these very successful, artistically successful enterprises that I'll be talking about today, that precede the ballets, uh, they all lost money. His patrons kept pulling out, uh, his uh, creditors kept chasing him, he had lawsuits all the time. Uh, and I think from today's point of view, we would also find him objectionable in all kinds of sorts of, for all sorts of reasons. You know, you will probably find if he was living today that he would be having lawsuits for bullying, um, for possibly sexual harassment. Um, for, mm, I don't know, uh, financial crimes, definitely, uh, copyright law uh, infringement, uh, all these things. Yeah, so, uh, but thankfully, I think all the people who could have fi filed these lawsuits are dead now, so uh, we're safe. So, uh, my first chapter is a boy from Pirm. Yeah, so Pirm is a little, well, not so little, but it was a little town in the Urals. Um, I've been there, uh, it has a beautiful river, it has now a Diaghilev festival. I've been in the school where Diaghilev uh, grew up. He was born in St. Petersburg, but his family uh, moved to the provincial estates. And uh, so he was a member of the aristocracy, uh, but by that stage, Russian aristocracy, apart from the very highest echelon, had to find some other source of income, yeah, because after the 1861, uh, liberation of serfs, they couldn't draw enough income from the estates. And also because there was no primogeniture, you know, these estates kept being divided be between all the children, including girls. So, uh, 
people were becoming uh, more and more impoverished. Uh, but his father uh, ran vodka distilleries <laughs> around Pirm uh, and uh, was doing quite well. So for that provincial scene, they were incredibly rich and well-respected. Yeah? If for Pro Petersburg, it wouldn't have done. But for Pirm, uh, he had a very privileged upbringing. He could learn languages and music and everything that um, a, a boy in his position would learn. As you can see, he had this sort of chubby face and wasn't a particularly dashing, ever beautiful man. But he certainly wasn't shy. And he had uh, charisma, he had charm, and he had a desire to always meet celebrities and talk to them and somehow be close to what's the best. So there are all these wild stories while he was still a teenager of him uh, seeking out to see Tolstoy and actually getting a conversation with him. Uh, you know, that they were asked to come back later, and he did come back later, and so on. T being terrified, but at the same time excited, being in the presence of a great man, was Tchaikovsky. He was, you know, Tchaikovsky died in 1893, so he was still only 21, and uh, there's a story of him learning about Tchaikovsky's death and ru rushing to the house uh, there and actually helping to carry Tchaikovsky's body from the bed to the table, whether it it's true or not, we don't know. So, uh, so he certainly wasn't shy, and that was a very important part uh, of his character. So uh, eventually his father went bankrupt. And uh, thankfully there was some money put aside into a trust for him, so he, he still kept the money and he was now in charge of his siblings as well. And he moved to St. Petersburg and started studying law at university being also at the same time very passionate about music and thinking about switching to conservatoire. Uh, he was very fond of his family. In fact, I think he wanted to carry his family with him. Uh, this is a famous portrait with his nanny. And you know, there was also a cousin whom he carried with him to Paris uh, and, and who was with him almost until his death. Uh, I think the, fa the fact of ba the bankruptcy means that, uh, on the one hand, he knows privilege and he relies on his privilege, and yet at the same t time he can cope with adversity. And I think this is how he behaved, because, you know, if things went wrong, he could always rely on some powerful friends who were rich. You know, somebody would always put him up, and yet at the same time um, he had to rely on himself as well. Uh, at university, he forms his first artistic circle. And the idea of an artistic circle is very important for our understanding of this whole enterprise, because basically these people also very, very important to, in founding uh, the idea of, of Diaghilev seasons. And some of them uh, were very influential on various projects that happened during that time. And of course, the artistic circle mentality was you're either in or you're out. Yeah? So I guess another charge in guess Diaghilev would be nepotism. Yeah? He always sought to promote his friends and, uh, and people that he knew. And uh, some people found it very difficult to cope with. For example, Prokofiev, Sergei Prokofiev, whom we're going to talk about in one of the next lectures, who always felt that he didn't quite belong, yeah? that there were always people closer to Diaghilev, and everyone wanted to be close to Diaghilev. So these three people are very important. Benoit, uh, Alexander Benoit, uh, who was an artist who worked in various genres, an art historian and a critic, incredibly important for the Belarus. His name will pop up all the time. Uh, Walter uh, Nouvel, uh, who was a pianist, amateur composer, they played duets with Diaghilev, and a writer who wrote a biography on Diaghilev then became his secretary as well. Uh, he was a very important person who uh, founded Evenings of Contemporary Music. That was a kind of another artistic cir circle which gave birth to Prokofiev and Stravinsky's fame. Yeah, so that will happen a bit later, but uh, he's also very important in that uh, trio. And uh, uh, the third man is Dima or Dmitry Filosofov, who was a, a journalist, critic, and a bit of a philosopher, as his name suggests. Um, 
And uh, he uh, was also influential on the ideas, general ideas of the um, world of art, the artistic uh, movement that Diaghilev started and also uh, possibly uh, the Saison Russe as well. But uh, also as a personal friend and lover, he was the first um, big um, affair, or as such, let's say, relationship that Diaghilev had. Um, and for that reason, then later fell uh, out with each other. Yeah. But it was a long relationship, uh, and he also went to Paris. They all emigrated. Uh, none of them stayed in Soviet Russia at different times. And there were another two people who were very much part of this university circle, and that was, uh, these were two uh, painters, uh, Konstantin Somov and Leon Bakst, also will, will be uh, making a lot of set designs. So their names uh, you will hear again. So uh, before we go get to our second chapter, uh, I should mention what Diaghilev had to do with music, yeah? because he was really a rather good amateur pianist and uh, he was an amateur composer. He was uh, absolutely fascinated with Wagner, and he made a pilgrimage to Bayreuth, yeah, to the Wagner Festival, heard the whole of the ring. And as you know, Wagner's operas are very long. Yeah, so he sat through them, he was excited, and then he said, he, he wrote in a letter, uh, this should be cut, really. <laughs> You know, um, and uh, Cosima Wagner, who is still alive, it's, uh, she's wrong not to allow the cuts. You know, that's too long. That's far too long. They should be cut. They're very good, but they should be cut. And that's, you know, that's exactly how he approached uh, various artistic projects that he commissioned. He interfered and cut everything. He uh, didn't want to bore his audience. Uh, and that was very important. And I think, you know, that attitude defined so much in modern performance arts and, and music because Diaghilev's ballet is not a three-act long thing. It's uh, like 40 minutes, 20 minutes, 50 minutes maybe maximum. Yes, it defines this new, very mobile form that you can put three in, in an evening and then you'll have a, a whole panoply of different contrasts and something more and more exciting, you know, lots of attractions for people. So I think that all stems from his visit to Bayreuth. Uh, so, yeah, he was also incredibly excited by Russian national music, uh, by Mussorgsky, even after um, familiarizing himself with Boris Godunov, he decided to rewrite one of the scenes himself. And he brought all this stuff to Rimsky-Korsakov, and Rimsky-Korsakov was incredibly dismissive, although He's always polite and very nice, yeah, but here he really had no, saw no spark, no chance, didn't want to delude him, and just said, no, you're not a composer, don't do it. And it was a huge blow for him. So after that, and with the influence of his artist's friend, he decided to go for art, for the visual arts, yeah. So uh, during his travels in Europe, for which he still uh, had money, he started buying art, buying watercolors, and he decided to exhibit them all in uh, Russia. So the first uh, thing that he did was importing Western Europe. Yeah? Our uh, lecture is called Exporting Russia. Before exporting Russia, he was importing Western Europe. And together with these exhibitions that he organized, he started publishing um, a journal, The World of Art, Mir Iskustva. And that also was an association of artists that mm, uh, were professing their ideals in this journal. So you can see one of the covers here. So that's 1898. So this is the beginning of his actual uh, working years, and we have 10 years still to go to the ballet. Yes, so we're not going to go to the ballet, get to the ballets today at all. Um, so to publish this journal, he found two very important patrons, and uh, I wanted to mention them separately. So Sava Mamantov was a great industrialist. It was a, a moment of huge burgeoning of Russian capitalism. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the Russian industry was growing. 
So he was the new money person and the great Mycenas, yeah, who supported various kinds of arts. And his estate in Abramsova. Uh, he had lots of artists just living there and having workshops, workshops and creating these incredible nationalist buildings, yeah, like that, like these huts, yeah, with, and uh, with a lot of exciting furniture inside, which uh, took these Russian folk motives and created something modern with them. Yeah, you might actually see something like that around here. Yeah, it, it chimes with the arts and crafts movement and, and lots of other things in other countries. Yeah, but, uh, and I've grew, grown up with the um, term for this, which uh, the Soviet textbooks used, which was the pseudo-Russian style. Yeah? which was dismissive, because they wanted to be dismissive about that period. But in fact, uh, we can call it a neo-nationalist style, yeah? because with pseudo, that means that there is something authentic, but no matter how much, how far you peel these layers of pseudo, you will never get to the true, because there's always going to be some import of fusion, yeah? and, and it's very difficult to find something that would be completely, totally uh, an un unadulterated Russian. Another thing that Mamontov supported was opera, and I think that's very important. He had a private opera company um, throughout the 90s and uh, also in the first decade of the 20th century. And that opera company uh, was dis distinguished itself by the fact that they did lots of premieres. You know, the imperial theatres such as the Mariinsky could only put you know, several huge shows a year, but uh, Mamatov could produce them almost every few weeks, yeah, which is, again is a kind of Diaghilev model already. And he had a great, because he was so interested in the visual arts, his sets were always amazing. Yeah? So it wasn't like he would reuse sets and designs and costumes from the, another opera, which was what imperial theatres would often do. Yeah? He would uh, engage, commission these artists to make new designs. The musical side of it was always not as good as the imperial theatres, yeah, because they didn't have the same kind of singers, but they always tried to improve. So they staged a lot of Rimsky-Korsakov's operas, um, and Rachmaninoff, for example, was a conductor of the Mamontov opera. And when you see then that all these people follow Diaghilev to Paris to promote Russia, you realize that he basically takes Mamontov opera and transplanted to some extent. Yes, yeah, so various ideas are already born there from Mamontov. Another patron was Princess Tenisheva, Maria Tenisheva, who was, uh, it was also married to an aristocrat who had new money as well. Yes, he was an industrialist as well. And she also had his or her own estate. And uh, wonderful buildings were there as well. Look at this church. Yeah, it looks like a Russian church. It has the elements of design that you would recognize in traditional Russian church architecture, but the, the proportions are all wrong. Yeah, it's kind of squeezed down and, uh, and it's very stylized. Yeah, so that's what, what we refer to. Yeah, we say it's sort of style over authenticity. That's what they were interested in. Uh, and the same happens with icons, you know, the uh, icons and mosaics that these artists create for her estate. They, look both old and new. Yeah, they modernize everything. And, uh, and they were won wonderful and, and exciting too. So uh, Mamandov and Tenyashiva uh, were patrons for the first year of the journal. Uh, they pulled out after the first year because first of all, he lost money. Secondly, there was some scandal because the journal turned out to be very controversial. Uh, and why, we're going to see in a moment. So if you look at this graphic again that I've already shown, you might realize that uh, it's inspired very much by Aubrey Beardsley. Yeah, and that was indeed somebody who was iconic for, uh, for the group. And you can see that this sort of erotic orientalist painting, for how, like for example, this belly dancer, uh, they, you know, influenced then Leon Bach's very famous um, oriental designs that he made for Diaghilev. Or another uh, example, yeah, he, uh, Beardsley was brought this fascination with Versailles, Louis, the, Louis XIV, and, um, and the, the 18th century, and all this um, 
uh, incredible fashions and formal gardens and masked balls. And you can see that both Somov and Benoit just basically almost copy yeah, <laughs> uh, the, these ideas. And that uh, also will be important for the very first ballet that Diaghilev would produce in Paris. So, uh, so this is the group, uh, the world of art. You can see this one woman there. This is Anna Straumova, uh, who was also uh, exhibited by Diaghilev quite a lot. Uh, so they were, they were a jolly bunch, but there were also a lot of arguments between them and people kept falling out and uh, falling in. Uh, I'll show you some more covers and it, it gives you an idea of what kind of art they were interested in. Yeah, so this is uh, Russian, <laughs> yeah, you can see almost sort of church Slavonic font, but at the same time it's also modernized and stylized. And so that's another woman artist, Palenova. Uh, this is like a Russian woodcut, yeah, very stylized and kind of primitivist. Um, and this is another nationalist, uh, almost like an engraving. Uh, and this is something else, yeah, this is symbolism. <laughs> yeah, so that's another uh, trend that obviously was very strong at that time. Uh, so they, they try to cover all, all of these new trends uh, and they all these new isms, uh, they were united only by one thing, that they were against realism. Yeah, so uh, the realism that they were against, this uh, can be represented in this couple of paintings that are my favorite since my childhood. Uh, by the group, the itinerants, yeah, because they were moving their exhibitions across Russia, and realism here doesn't mean just uh, illusionism. Uh, yeah, it doesn't just mean representing life almost as you see it, but um, interest in the plight of the poorer classes. Yeah, so you have to find the most destitute people and, uh, and create sympathy for them. This is another one, although there's more stylization here. You see it's almost like, like, almost like a Madonna yeah, in, among the prisoners who are looking out of this prison carriage to the pigeon, pigeons feeding and fighting for their food. So, um, and this realism uh, was promoted by the great ideologue Vladimir Stasov, who was uh, incredibly uh, rude about Diaghilev's first exhibition in 1898, which was a Russia, Russo Finnish exhibition, and said this is an orgy of debauchery and decadence. Yeah. Uh, but actually, you know, I think they were delighted probably by this. Um, uh, you will see why in a moment. So uh, the, these oppositions um, emerge uh, out of the world of art. So um, they profess beauty against the harsh truth, art for art's sake versus art that's socially responsible, Fascination with the past and kind of eternal ideas and various style, multiplicity of styles, eclecticism, as opposed to this topicality of the present. Also applied art, you know, versus just easel painting. They really start doing uh, book graphics, yeah, the set designs, costumes, furniture, uh, enamels, uh, ceramics, everything. Yeah, so they, they get involved with that. Now, and another thing is uh, art determines life versus life determines art. Yeah, so, uh, which meant that they tried to live their life in an aestheticized way. And sometimes it led to, to very tragic stories, you know, because sometimes people were trying to be characters in symbolist novels and ended up committing suicide or going on drugs and because they had to live their life in that particular way. Um, and, uh, but they really believed, and this is why they all wore these fancy clothes and uh, yeah, and tried to live in uh, luxury hotels and eat oysters, I don't know. <laughs> they had to create this aestheticized atmosphere around them. Uh, so, a little chapter about Diaghilev's uh, doubling in imperial theaters. Uh, through one of the artists who worked uh, for the world of art, Alexander Sirov, he got a royal patron pa patronage. And that's uh, a completely different thing now. Yeah? So you're not just supported by industrialists, by this new money, you're actually supported by the Russian court. 
uh, and that's of course amazing. So he actually got a job uh, of editing the uh, annual for the Imperial Theatre, annual publication, because uh, the printing standards of the World of Art magazine were so much higher than ev everything around. They were really sort of luxury books, and they were bound together. You know, f it, it was just a, a thing of beauty. So he was given this job. But somehow uh, an idea arose that he should direct a ballet, that he, he should produce a ballet. And this was the first ballet, uh, uh, his first encounter with a ballet, very traditional kind of ballet. It was by Leo de Lieb. Uh, it was called Sylvia. And he didn't produce it in the end. <laughs> um, before I say that, I wanted to show this quote, because it seems that Degelief at that point wasn't interested in ballet at all. But this is a very interesting prophetic quote from uh, um, Walter Nouvelle. Yeah, I remember one of my three people that were close to Degelief from the very start. And this is even before the world of art, and this is what Nouvelle says. I think ballet has a great future ahead of it, but of course it's not in the form in which it exists at present, which was classical ballet. He has a petit pas in this sort of big, huge, very formal affair. Our decadent aesthetic and sensual demands can't be satisfied by the ideals of plasticity and beauty of uh, movement that existed 30 years ago. We must make it a vehicle for our tender, refined, morbid feelings, sensations and aspirations. We must make it sensual par excellence, but sensual aesthetically and, if you like, symbolically. That vague and expressible elusive feeling to which modern literature is trying to give voice, a being the clamorous demands of the modern spirit must find, and the low likelihood will find its realization in ballet. Yeah, so I th I've, what I like about this quote is that he, they actually identify as decadent. Yeah, they're saying we are soft and refined and you know, we don't all want all your dirt and, and crudeness. Yeah, so this is the way how they position themselves aesthetically. And it's just fascinating that uh, he thinks of Bali as a potential way forward. Uh, anyway, what happened with that project is that there was a power struggle and Diaghilev uh, was not really made for a government job. Yeah, as you can imagine, yeah, he, could not, he was not a bureaucrat. He wanted to do everything himself. He wanted to get his hands dirty. He wanted to com complete command of everything. He was uh, all, almost you know, often obnoxious and uh, insubordinate, and, and he was sacked. So that was the end of that. So he was now without a job, and he decided uh, to start something else. Uh, and... Uh, the next thing that he does is another exhibition. So the first one in 1898 was, uh, the, was a big uh, exhibition of watercolors, Western European ones. Now uh, he actually decides to collect Russian painting and realizes that Russian's 18th century portraits are not known in the capital. Yeah, so what he does, he just takes a coach and rides across the provinces uh, he's not scared of the provinces because he's from the provinces. Yeah, and he collects from these decaying estates uh, Russian art. He develops uh, an eye for it. He becomes a scholar of it. He becomes a specialist. He writes a book. Yeah, so this is amazing how he, he reinvents himself again into, into a scholar of art. And uh, this is uh, a photograph uh, from that exhibition in 1905, the Russian portrait exhibition at the Tarida Palace, uh, which was also supported by the court. And you can see that there's elements of design already present. For example, there's always some kind of background cloth that he used to, to hang the paintings. It had to be of a certain color. Yeah, uh, the, there's a symmetry there yeah, that on, on either side. You can see that there's something uh, at play there. But the most amazingly that this, this is, was art that was not known. And so Russia did not know its own riches. So he, he made an impact there for sure. Uh, but of course, 1905, many of you will realize, was the revolutionary year. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, there was a, the, the great uh, massacre um, by the Cossack, Cossack troops uh, of an unarmed demonstration, uh, and there were a lot of strikes, uh, 
And basically, uh, it was all the result of the very um, unfortunate uh, military adventure in Japan yeah, that Russia lost. Um, so, uh, in 1905, it was very difficult for Diaghilev to think of what the next project might be. And there's a great, great quote here that also explains to us why he decides to take it to Paris. The end was here in front of me. Remote, boarded up family estates, palaces frightening in the dead grandeur. We are living in a terrifying era of upheaval. We must give up our lives for the resurgence of a renewed culture. This is what history teaches us and aesthetics confirms. Yeah, so he now feels that there is a need for renewal of life as well as art. Yeah, again, they come together. And then he talks about himself. You can do one of only two things now. Either go out into the town square and give yourself to every momentary madness, yeah, so to become part of the strike movement to support revolutionaries, as Rimsky Korskov, by the way, did by resigning his post uh, in solidarity with striking students. Uh, or to sit it out in your study, cut off from life. I like town squares, but only in opera or in a small Italian town. I just love this. You know, every time I come to a small Italian town, I remember Diaghilev. But I am not a study man either. So he feels like there, there is no, uh, that Russia is not the right platform for his, uh, um, for his activities. And this is why he goes to Paris. So the next year, 1906, he already uh, brings Russian art to, uh, to Paris. Again, on the grand scale. This is also supported by the court. Yeah, because it's, it's taken as an initiative yeah, to promote Russian art abroad. Um, and he exhibits it at the Salon d'Automne in 12 rooms, 750 paintings. And it's really encyclopedic. Yeah, it started with the icons, which he put against gold clo cloth, and it ended with the very new art, such as Rubel, uh, for example, or, well, this also, this was a the kind of folk logo of it. Um, he was looking for paintings that would not look uh, as if they were just copied from the West. He looked for something original, for something astonishing. And this emphasis on the very recent, uh, again on his friends from the world of art, was very new and uh, made, made a mark there. So, uh, we go to our next chapter, and the next chapter is musical. So the next season, yeah, so you can see that the, the seasons are different. He never repeats himself, and this was this is another thing that happens, uh, was the Russian Music Festival. And I don't think a, a, a festival of Russian music ever happened abroad anywhere at any time. I think it's the first one, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there were sometimes little sort of Russian concerts within uh, Paris expositions yeah, at various points, but not on this scale. And so he put on five concerts and uh, there was a particular emphasis there uh, that he chose that is very interesting. If you take a look at the chronological table of what Russian works were played abroad, it would be mostly Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, 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 Symphony Number no. Six. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was a great uh, um, great hit. You know, Tchaikovsky was already dead, of course, for a long time, but. Um, his music really paved the way for an understanding of Russian culture. And Diaghilev did something different. He made an emphasis on this group of composers, which are called Maguchi Kuchko, the Mighty Handful. Yeah, these five composers, uh, four of them, or three of them are very well known. Yeah, Mussorgsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, and um, Borodin. And uh, the fourth one is slightly less known, Balakirev, although he was the most important of them. And QE is even less known, uh, but nevertheless, they're called the five. So, uh, if you look at the programs of these concerts, you can see that um, uh, they, they dominate. Yeah? He, he has Tchaikovsky there as well, but it's also interesting what he doesn't choose Symphony Number no. 6. He chooses Symphony Number no. 2, which was written 
under the influence of the five, yeah, and has a, a particular idea, uh, a musical idea, which I'm going to illustrate in a moment, which is different from this usual dramatic music that he writes. So uh, Glinka, who wasn't a member of the five, but he was the banner, the absolute, you know, uh, acorn from which the, the great tree of Russian music uh, was growing, uh, and, and Borodin. Uh, Rimsky-Korsakov himself was conducting. It was incredibly difficult for Diaghilev to convince him to come. He was in the last year of his life. He hated all this PR exercise, you know, the noise. He was very much of a study man, a very modest person. And Diaghilev kept coming to him. And remember, Rimsky-Korsakov kicked him out. Yeah, so uh, he kept coming to him because in the absence of Tchaikovsky, this was the only figure that would really give the festival this particular prominence. And uh, he believed in celebrity, as we know. So eventually, uh, Rimsky Korsakov couldn't resist. Yeah, after, so he came to him 10 times and he said, OK, I will do it. So he conducted in almost every concert something of his own. It was mainly operas, mainly fairy tales operas, yeah, which were kind of fantastic and, and beautiful and with great orchestration and so on. So imagine that the idea of Russia that people would have in Paris at the time would have had before this, uh, it had to do with literature. Yeah? And Russian literature, as we know, is extremely dramatic, tragic, melancholy. Yeah? The Russian character is always described as sad. Yeah? The Russian songs are described as sad. And suddenly, these concerts presented the new picture of Russia, which was incredibly colorful. It was just colorful and um, joyful as well. Uh, now listen to this. This is the finale of Tchaikovsky Symphony No. 2. from this uh, little folk tune, which is a Ukrainian folk tune. Uh, and it keeps repeating. Yeah, it keeps repeating. There is no drama there. There is no uh, big uh, emotion. Yeah, it's all about dance and color, different colors. It all comes from Glinka. As I told you, Glinka is the acorn from which all that kind of music grew. Um, which they believed well, was really Russian and nationalist, and from his piece Kamarinsky, which he also played there, because uh, Diaghilev, I think, was a little bit of a kind of, he wanted this encyclopedic approach. He wanted to see the roots, the way he presented the icons in his exhibition. He also wanted to present um, the, the beginnings of Russian music. So listen to, to this folk tune. on yeah, dozens of times uh, you know my, my colleague uh, at Cambridge Robin Holloway always says that this is where minimalism comes from <laughs> this is the invention of minimalism right? um, so um, and another piece by Glinka, which I'm sure you know uh, this is a very joyful piece again he chooses these these very colorful things <laughs> Yeah, 
so uh, another joyful piece. Another thing that he did in this concert, the very first concert, he introduced a great celebrity, a great Russian bass, Fyodor Shalyapin. Yeah, he uh, uh, sang a Prince Galitsky aria from Borodin's opera Prince, Prince Igor. And Galitsky is this, um, he's not a very positive character. He's actually quite a negative character. Yeah, he, he, he just wants to drink and, and have girls and instead of looking up to the country. Yeah, so completely irresponsible. But, you know, with this great Russian, I don't know, abandon. Uh, so, uh, and Shalapin came out and completely stole the show, and we have his, his own performance. Although we can't see him, yeah, there's no video of Shalapin singing, but everyone says he was an amazing actor. So you can hear him acting with his voice. Yeah, so uh, this acting was absolutely irresistible. Yeah, so there was a huge ovation after, after every time Sh Shalapin came out on stage. That also ended up in scandal because a great conductor, another celebrity who wasn't Russian, Arthur Nikish, yeah, so this was so outraged by, by the behavior of the audience that he refused to come out on stage after Shalapin and so on. And of course, Diaghilev courted scandal. He loved scandal, yeah, because the scandal and controversy always uh, sold more tickets, always uh, yeah, created more reviews and so on. So, uh, if you uh, just look, I, I actually put the, all the programs here, not for you to... Uh, Ponder at great length, but just to see that there's more Rimsky, Korsakov, yeah, and then Mussorgsky's fragments from Boris Godunov, which uh, were also sung by Shalapin, which of course is a different kind of thing, a very dramatic thing, um, but um, we'll talk about it a, a tiny moment later. And again, Rimsky, Korsakov. Uh, here's something else, you know, Scriabin Piano Concerto. He actually wanted to bring Scriabin as well with his new piece, uh, The Poem of Ecstasy, but it wasn't ready, so he failed in that. Um, and uh, Glazunov, he, was, he brought Glazunov uh, also, that was another live composer. Uh, he brought Rachmaninoff to play his second piano concerto by, for, you know, for a moment. That was another attraction. It's even lost in the whole thing that was happening with Shalapin. But remember that both Shalapin and Rachmaninoff uh, were connected to the moment of opera. Yeah, Shalapin was also a, a soloist, star soloist there. So it's like he's just bringing his friends. They happen to be these amazing celebrities. And Balakiri of Tamara, a very important piece because it's an oriental piece. Yeah, orientalism will become a huge uh, topic in, in our lectures to come. And this, again, is uh, the same kind of picturesque music but with an oriental color. don't know this piece, you know, I would describe it to you as a kind of anticipation of Scheherazade. Basically, Rimsky Korsakov stole uh, <laughs> about half of it <laughs> for his piece, yeah, uh, and it became then more famous than Tamara. But Tamara already has all these, these oriental idioms. Uh, so, 
and then, yeah, the final concert where, again, you have Rimsky-Korsakov, again, with a fairy tale. Another, uh, Lipunov is another student of Balakirev. Yeah, so it's all from the same nationalist group. Ladov is a student of Rimsky-Korsakov. Yeah, you have a particular emphasis on this very joyful music to do with fairy tale, to do with a mighty handful, rather than uh, on Tchaikovsky. Yeah, so there's no Tchaikovsky sex. And our final chapter is uh, the next year, 1908, which is Diaghilev's production of Boris Godunov in Paris. Yeah, so he is capitalizing on two things, on the success of Mussorgsky, which was noticed there. He made contacts with the French critics, which were particularly interested in Mussorgsky. Debussy, of course, was a great admirer of Mussorgsky, was influenced by him. Yeah, so he was another voice to, uh, to have in favor of doing this. This opera was, uh, had never been performed, staged, outside Russia. So the fact that this is now the most famous Russian opera internationally is due to Dagilev. Uh, and to Shalapin as well, because Shalapin was Boris, yeah, so he capitalized on his success as well. Now, it was a hugely problematic and controversial thing to do, because they had to do it in Russian. Usually operas weren't sung in Russian at that point. Yeah, they were usually translated into Italian, no matter which country they originated from. And actually, there is an Italian translation of Boris, which was sung at the Met a few years later. But they were singing it in Russian. There were no surtitles. People had no idea, really, what, what the singers were saying. The opera is very, very verbal, you know, relies on words, relies on dialogue. It's very based on declamation. Uh, and Diaghilev, of course, was very impatient. It's also very long. Yeah, so you can see how he started cutting scenes. So he says, not so much it would seem as lost from the omission of the scene in Marina's boudoir, Marina Mnichik, a Polish princess. And without it, there are still ma many pages of genius in Boris. Concerning the first scene of the prologue, my considerations are of entirely different character. The scene begins brilliantly, but concludes with a perfectly vague theatrical impression. And after this, and this is most important, an untracked of no less 15 minutes, it is necessary to prepare the coronation scene. Yeah, so he has to, he realizes he has to have this very short scene at the start. And then a 15 minute break. Yeah, so people would, would not know what, what is happening. And he says, uh, this coronation scene is the most important thing. Yeah, the French will go mad with its grandeur. That means besides the sets, one must place the stage no fewer than 300 people. And this can delay the spectacle for more than a quarter of an hour. That's right away the effect of the opera goes limp, and it would be very difficult to smooth this away in what follows. Yeah, so this... Uh, may, so at first he just wanted to cut this first scene, but then he thought of a different solution. He took one of the scenes after the coronation scene and moved it before. Chronologically, it didn't make any sense, yeah, because uh, somebody is trying to accuse Boris of crimes and Boris is not yet Tsar. Yeah, so chronologically, no, it doesn't matter. But dramatically, it was good for the opera because then you could have a proper two scenes and then an entract. Yeah, and then you could have the coronation scene to which everything uh, was, was uh, at which everything was thrown. Now, the uh, 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 version that they were using was the edition of Rimsky-Korsakov. Yeah, I mentioned it in one of my previous lectures about Boris Godunov specifically. That Rimsky-Korsakov actually rewrote the opera. Yeah, so rewrote about 80% of it, uh, sort of delicately, but he changed various things and increased the orchestration, made it more colorful. And when this was performed in Rimsky-Korsakov's version, there were voices of protest from Debussy, you know, first of all. You know, why can't we hear the original Mussorgsky? But uh, it wasn't, you couldn't do it because all the singers, including Shalapin, only knew the Rimsky-Korsakov version. They could not relearn it. Um, so in, in that such short time, it just was impossible to do. But Rimsky-Korsakov was still around, so to make this coronation scene even grander, he asked him to write a little bit more music. <laughs> yeah, so that the French would, would really be uh, knocked, knocked out by that. 
Uh, imagine this this kind of set. Uh, the sets were completely wild. You know, n nothing at the Paris Opera uh, was was like that before. Even when they were unpacking, when they, they, there was a kind of whiff of scandal. What is it going to be? Uh, and of course, Shalapin as Boris, uh, the most amazing uh, actor. I'll just give you a little bit of the, his uh, madness scene. Yeah, when he's being chased by the ghost. <laughs> if you don't know any words, yeah, it still makes a huge impression. Um, so, of course, he had to finish with Shalapin. So he had to finish with the death of Boris, which meant that he had to switch another couple of scenes around <laughs> because Rinsky, uh, sorry, Mussorgsky actually had another scene, scene after that. So the whole, the Diaghilev version is, is a, a travesty. <laughs> yeah, and it's an absolute piece of vandalism. And yet that's what presumably was necessary for him to push this opera out into the wide world, yeah, over the language barrier. Uh, and uh, this has worked, yeah, because then uh, you can have different productions, but it already has a name, it's known. And it had a huge critical success, uh, and the elite sort of thought it was, it was just wonderful. So, uh, to just give you a few uh, pointers, as to what Diaghilev has already established, because we're going to move next time to the ballet, and these all things of the ballet ruse are already in place, even without the ballet. Emphasis on spectacle is absolutely paramount. His all friendships with artists result in this fascination with the visual. The sense of Russian difference. This was extremely important. Shalapin actually made uh, this statement at one point. He said, this is an exam that we are passing in before Western Europe. This is Russian culture being presented. Yeah? And, well, they passed the exams, but this is really, the, this was a sense where Russia, which always felt culturally inferior to Western Europe, could show what they have done, what they have achieved. Yeah, so the sense of difference. Modernity, the fact that this nationalism could be presented in a modern way. Even Boris Godunov, despite the fact that it was written in the 1870s, was actually heard as a modernist opera. Yeah, you could hear all these sort of dissonances and um, sort of shapeless uh, declamation, which uh, was very forward-looking. And this is why Debussy was so, so pleased with that. Celebrity, yeah, always this investment in celebrity and uh, kind of exciting quality uh, of uh, whether singing or dancing or painting, whatever, in whatever he presented. Controversy, as I said, uh, was always welcome. Yeah, so uh, he, he was not trying to, uh, he knew that he would be panned and he would go for it, so that he was absolutely fearless about this. Total control, as I hope you've noticed, with Boris Godunov, you know, cut, you know, compose. Yeah, uh, uh, the author has to stand back, even if he's dead, but even if he's alive, he still has to stand back and look at how Diaghilev is cutting up his ballet or opera. And this control 
goes uh, to produce an, an artistic synthesis so that all the arts work together yeah, so that nothing is left to chance again no um, re recycling costumes in opera yeah everything is done afresh and everything is done with the idea of sometimes matching and sometimes not matching sometimes contrasting yeah so that you would have uh, an, a classical music and Picasso's cubist sets. You know, this idea is already brought here with this outrageous sets for Boris Godunov. So these are uh, a few um, slogans, I suppose, with which Diaghilev makes a further step. Don't remind me very much of a kind of fundraising com campaign. Can <laughs> they put them now? But um, I wanted to finish with that coronation scene. And although, of course, I can't give you anything from the Diaghilev production, but just uh, something from the Bolshevik theater that will give you an idea of what the French fell for. Thank you.